the agenda, we are going to talk about the conceptual architecture. We are going to talk about a lot of times IoT is associated with hardware. Right? We think about sensors, we think about um, communication, connectivity, analytics, a lot of things. But what really makes IoT really great or more accessible to a large developer community is the software stack that sits on top of it. We will conceptually discuss what it really means. Um, then we're going to talk about like uh, almost all IoT solutions start with a rapid prototype, right? A duct tape solution where you're putting some things together and you want to try things out, you want to demonstrate that idea to your management or whatever, pitch that idea and say, okay, I've got an idea that I conceptually kind of works. And now you want to take that forward to a real product. Uh, we will talk about that journey. I mean, that's really what the path to product really is. Uh, we originally wanted to bring a demo here, but uh, uh, because it's being demonstrated down the hall uh, and uh, we were set up, we want to keep it there because we didn't, we couldn't find the, the time where the demo was available there and here and all that. So that didn't work out. But we're going to discuss the journey that we went through to putting the demo together. Okay, so Daniel is going to discuss about like you know the how to scale the solution, what the kind of challenges he went through, type of gateway choices that he had to make, um, all of that we will discuss about. It. Then we are going to talk about some of the next steps and key learnings. Uh, please ask questions as we go through. We want this to be really interactive, um, and hopefully uh, we will cover the stuff. As I said, right, almost all IoT solutions start with a prototype, which is a duct tape thing, right? When um, I started working in IoT about two plus years ago, my goal was mainly to support makers, right? Makers where we went and did hackathons, events, we built a set of software tools that enables these makers to build some creative solutions. What amazed me was like how the makers were really interested in taking those concepts, evolving those concepts, and want to productize it. But the problem is that the maker world is viewed as a different world than the world that is the mature, more stable offerings, right? The capabilities or the requirements that developers look for is different, but they're not really. I mean, you, you have a set of things that I've learned in this, uh, in this journey of doing this, that uh, there's a lot of commonality as well that we can move forward, right? Every day I see makers come in and they create some amazing solutions. Right. And they take simple ideas and they evolve those ideas to an extent that I cannot even imagine. Um, as an example, right, um, one team came and when I was supporting this makers thing, they came and did a simple project with a, with a water plant, right? With a moisture sensor and if there is not enough moisture, the water will automatically sprinkle and it will do whatever, right? Light and stuff. So I had this project and I thought, okay, this is great. But some other team came up and they said, well, we've got an idea that we want to use that. And we want to add a twist to it, right? I said, well, what can you do with it, right? I thought, okay, fine. And they replicated the entire setup in less than two hours. And the twist they added to that was they connected that entire thing to their Fitbit API. So if you don't work out for the week, the plant doesn't get its work. So you can literally see the plant die in front of you if you're not meeting your fitness goals. Right? Um, you, and and the, the thing is, and they, they, the concept was great, and they wanted to move that into a more stable offering and everything else, which is difficult, right? I have examples where people come and build a small chicken coop, where uh, they use the rapid prototype, they use a bunch of sensors and build it, and now they're saying, oh, well, we want to take that and deploy it in a commercial scale. There's a gap, right? It's very difficult to do it. So, what we really, um, the reason why is simple, right? The reason is when you're doing prototype, there are certain things that really matter to you. Like things like you want to start very, very quickly. You don't want to spend a lot of time learning stuff. You want to start with lots of examples, right? Code samples. As I gave you an example where people use a watering plant system and they evolve that solution, right? There's a lot of code samples out there in the maker community, and that's why the do it yourself movement is so popular. People use existing solutions and they evolve it. And that's what they're looking for. A um, lot of open source and free tools, right? Um, because people love to kind of take, like borrow steel core and, and build their solution. 
That's, that's very prevalent. Um, then they, they don't want to learn something really new. It's an existing programming language, it's IDEs they want to use. Set of um, middleware libraries. People love APIs, right? I like APIs too. Um, and, and, the, and the real concept behind that is you have a set of hardware abstraction layers that people want to just use it and, and evolve that. And some cloud connectivity, right? I always keep saying people that I of IoT is internet, right? Um, when, when we were when I started like working on the IoT stuff, the first thing I did was I had a button with an LED. I pushed the button, the LED blew, and I was like, "Wow, this is great!" I was very excited that I could do this in software. But then I realized Thomas Alva Edison did it when, and why am I getting excited about it, right? But what really excited me was I could take that button and move it to my phone, connect it with the Bluetooth. That was interesting. Then I was able to move that button to my uh, uh, to the cloud. So I could be on a vacation and I could still turn it on and light. Then I started thinking, like imagine that if you had the data, if I knew that how long that bulb was on, I could potentially predict and tell that, hey, look, in the next hour, this bulb is going to die before it gets So the, the thing about IoT is taking an idea and putting stuff on a cloud, doing the analytics, doing stuff, that's what makes it interesting, right? That's why the cloud connectivity is important. But now when you're, when you're saying, okay, I'm done with my prototype, I have a proof of concept, I want to evolve this into a product, there are things that change, right? All of a sudden, your performance is important. All of a sudden, device management, security. You, you have to worry about so many other things that you normally won't worry when you're doing a prototype solution. There is, uh, but still, right, you're looking for vertical end-to-end -end solutions. You're working for some vertical use cases. You're looking at, um, like you know, industrial sensors. Well, this is what I also learned, right? That said, there is a cheap two-dollar temperature sensor that you can actually use to do your prototype. But once you really want to do your product, that sensor becomes a lot more expensive. But the difference really is, it's it's like would be a Modbus sensor, or it could be transmitting the temperature data not to a GPIO pin, or it could be transmitting through a Bluetooth or to a Wi-Fi or something else. It's more industrial rugged and the accuracy of the temperature might be a lot better. But the thing is, it's still temperature, right? But the problem is trying to take your the thing that you did with the simple digital I.O. type sensor to your Modbus sensor, what is the journey that you go through, right? So um, again, right, you, you require private cloud and third-party integration. You have to integrate with your existing infrastructure. There's a lot of challenges when it comes to productizing an IoT solution. But all solutions still start with a prototype, right? And what we really did, as you heard today in the biggest announcement this morning at the keynote, we talked about the commercial developer kit. What the commercial developer kit really is, 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 is a set of tools and capabilities that will enable you to go through that journey from a prototype to a product. Okay? So that's really what it is, and that's the architecture that I'm going to talk to you about. So conceptually, at the end of the day, right, when people come and ask me, hey, look, you have too many hardware choices. There's a lot of gateways, there's a lot of like there's Edison, there's Galileo, you talk about Curie. Why? Right? Whenever somebody comes to me in an IoT world and tells me that there is something called a one size fits all, they're joking. It doesn't happen that way. There is every business has a different need, every IoT solution is structured differently. The challenges that you have in an IoT deployment are different. Right? Um, and you need to have the ability to kind of scale your hardware as your needs evolve. Right? I gave you an example of a bulb, right, with a button. Now, how about if you want to control all the lights in your house? How about if you want to control all the lights in your building? Or maybe the city, maybe the country, right? <laughs> the solution evolves, and your hardware and your capabilities need to evolve that way, right? So that's why when you look at the hardware, right, the support that we have is for the Edison, the Galileo, the Intel IoT gateway platforms. Uh, the gateway, like it's all the OEM gateways that's being demonstrated uh, down there, so all of them we support. Um, sensors and actuators. But the thing is, uh, all of this is hardware is fine, but you, what hardware, the, the really what makes it tick is the software stack that sits on top of it, which is uh, a choice of different OS images. Right? Um, the reason why we, we started with the Yamato Linux images 
We also believe that when you want to productize an IoT solution, you want an ability to pick and choose the kind of Linux modules that you want on your gateway. So that's why uh, we chose that, and then there is the Windriver Linux as, uh, as a capability that we support. So, but the, but the, uh, the middleware, right? The, the reason why we invented or we, we built those middleware libraries is because that we learned again the hard way that you need to keep the hardware abstraction from the developers, otherwise IoT solutions are gets too complex, right? Uh, we learned the hard way that once we had the Galileo Gen 1, we had an IoT solution, Gen 2 came along, the file structure changed, the pin mapping changed a bit, and then your solution had to be replumbed to, to work with that new hardware. So we built this hardware abstraction layer, the I.O. libraries and, and the sensor actuator libraries, so that way you can change or swap your underlying hardware technology without having to really go back and change all your code. Right? Um, so that's the reuse that we wanted to get. So that's why we have this I.O. libraries. Uh, and again, these are all open source. But when I say open source, some people cringe, right? They say, oh my god, open source, are you talking GPM? No, none of our code is GPM, right? It's MIT. So that way you can take any of that code, you can take any of our code samples, evolve from top of it, um, it's, it's, it's okay. And we also have a lot of commercial products that will help you in your commercial deployment. We'll talk about that once we go up the, uh, up the stack, right? Um, then there is uh, the communication stack, because as I said, a cheap $2 sensor could connect to a GPIO, um, but like when you have a real sensor in an industrial setting, if it's going to sit inside a, uh, in, a, in a oven or a steel mill, you can't imagine to have like a, that temperature sensor, right? It needs to be industrial grade, it needs to have a lot of other parameters. And the way it would probably communicate back to a gateway is going to be different as well. And that's the communication stack we're talking about. On top of it, um, we always believe that there is going to be a prototype thing that you want to get started quickly with Arduino perhaps, or with some kind of a visual programming tool that we have called Billiodren. Um, but then again, there is the phases that you go through to evaluate, deploy, uh, develop, and deploy kind of phases. We have a set of tools there, right? Um, Intel XTK uh, for doing Node.js type programming. We also have an Eclipse IDE that you could use for both Java and C++ programming. There is a Wind River IDP Workbench, which has got a lot of robust capabilities. Performance optimization tools through Intel System Studio. Helix has a set of capabilities for device manageability, so that once you have a production deployment, where you have gateways spread all over the world, how do you really manage it? How do you send um, commands to that gateway? How do you translate the protocols? There is like a bunch of stuff that you have to do. That's what is given by Helix uh, capability. Then we have um, the Windriver Simix. Um, that is a simulation type capability that allows you to really figure out what your network loads are, how much of work that you really need to do, where, kind of thing. And Cofluent is Studio is another tool that we have that allows you to do um, your planning, right? So that way you can determine what the ne network loads are, how many gateways you really need, what type of a gateway you need, that kind of stuff. So there is all these capabilities out there. Um, what we are trying to do with this commercial developer kit is making all of it developer friendly, making it available so that you can do a prototype and then evolve that solution over to a real production deployment. And then you have the IoT cloud analytics capability, which is really like you want to do some edge uh, analytics, you want to do some uh, cloud analytics, or you want to use whatever your favorite third party cloud is. So all that is fine, right? You could still use any of those whether you're doing through a prototype or product. So conceptually, this is the kind of an architecture that we are evolving with this commercial developer kit that enables you to take your product that you actually have built on a Galileo and move that product onto a real um, gateway. Right? It could be any of the commercial gateways that we have. So that's the, that's the real concept, and, and uh, that's the premise that we, um, that we have built this whole structure with that assumption that you always start things with a prototype and you want to evolve your solution, not necessarily um, like you know, start with, with a finished product, right? Because a lot of times you don't know what a finished product might be. Now, again, right, the the as I said, the, the key thing that we learned is if people want to start something quick, need things needs to be quick. So we built like a set of capabilities that allows you to install 
um, like the set of tools that you actually need. Uh, you don't have to have all of the things that you need, but a, but an installer that allows you or it guides you to the process, right? It will tell you that, okay, step one, you do this, step two, you do this, and it guides you to the process. Everything is set up on both your host and target, and I mean the target, the target could be any of the board, and the host could be your Windows, Linux, or other machines. So we have, we have, we have that. Uh, we have built a set of middleware libraries, as I said, one is called Limbra, uh, which is a, a IO library, right? Which will give you the abstraction for UART, SPI, GPIO, a bunch of these capabilities. Um, in fact, it supports a whole range of uh, products, the Edison, the Minaboard Max, and uh, like, you know, Galileo. In fact, the community loved this library so much that they took it up and they ported the libraries uh, to Raspberry Pi and Google Board back as well. So the, the, these libraries, right, will allow that type of a portability between these hardware platforms. Then there's UPM, which is a set of sensor libraries, which is all in MIT licensed, where you can connect any of these complex sensors. You don't have to do the hard work of reading the sensor specs, understanding what functions it provides, how do you configure the sensors. All of these libraries give you code samples and capabilities that allow you to connect to these bunch of sensors. So here you see a set of sensors that we support and more, right? You can go to the GitHub link that was there on the previous slide, and you will be able to see all of the sensors that we support, uh, from transportation to robotics to home automation to whatever. So all of these sensors are supported and more, right? We have about uh, more than 150 plus sensors that we support. And these sensors are like uh, the chips, right? The underlying chips for that sensor that we support. So many manufacturers could use that underlying chip and make many sensors out of it. So in essence, we support a lot more, but like 150 is the set of chips that we support, range of sensors, right? So um, I, I again, right, every time I have seen uh, programs is, is about evolution, right? Nobody starts from scratch. Um, you know, Cunning and Achieve, my favorite C book, Hello World is, is a great thing, but uh, you do it for learning, but after that, you're if you're building any complex projects, you're not starting a lower, right? You're taking an existing sample, existing template, existing something, and evolving from there. That's the premise, and that's what we uh, we want to do there. Um, so again, a community of samples and code is out there that you can start building your prototype uh, very very quickly. Um, and evolve that prototype, right? Every time I turn around, I see an example of something being used for something else. Um, but our team did a water flow sensor they used and they built like flow monitoring of water through the pipe, right? I expected that that would be used for drought control or, or home automation, something, right? I never realized that some uh, 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 IoT maker came to one of our events. They took that same example and they, he was a, he's a, professionally he's a uh, trumpet teacher. So he teaches students how to play trumpet and flute. So he wanted to use that same project to let students like you know blow through the pipe so he can calculate like what is the frequency that they need to actually blow so that he showed the graph and teach students how to blow that so that's the beginning of how you blow a trumpet. I never imagined that somebody would take a water flow meter and make a trumpet teaching tool out of it, right? Uh, but who am I to guess, right? Um, I want to seed the community of developers like yourself with a whole range of examples and core and let's see what innovation people come up with, uh, right? Uh, so that's really what uh, we want to do. So from there, right, uh, similarly, we, we are building solution blueprints and case studies that are more developer friendly in automotive, transportation, healthcare, uh, retail, smart buildings, all these areas. There, a lot of code samples will be made available, a lot of projects where people can take this and I want to see what they come up with, right? Um, everywhere I turn around, there is innovation and what we really do as Intel is providing a platform on which you can, a foundation, right? That you can innovate on top. And that's what we want to do and that's what we'll continue to do uh, supporting this. With that said, um, let me hand off to Daniel who's going to talk about the deployment of an IoT architecture and how he's, um, how he's using this prototype to a product evolution and he'll walk you through some code and some samples and cloud and all of that. So, um, again, Daniel, thank you. Thank you very much, Ajay. Is this, can you hear me? Okay, great. So thank you very much, Ajay. I'm going to get more into specifics 
of using the Intel IoT Commercial Developer Kit to create a particular SKU. On the previous slide, you saw that uh, Intel is looking at IoT differently depending on the vertical that you're going into in, in automotive, different in industrial. So when I was given this task, we were told to actually create an industrial demo. And this demo needed to be able to be broken up into parts that can be used for teachable components in learning how to take a product from a prototype, to a, an idea from a prototype to a product. So the first thing I wanted to show you is, is that I don't know if you've seen this slide in other talks at all, but this is a very large scale uh, IoT architecture that you might see. Over here, is this a laser pointer as well? It is. So over here you have edge devices, sensors and actuators, and these could be anything from uh, video cameras to, in, in my house I have a video camera that's mounted above my garage that uses an Intel Edison to do detect faces that are going up and down my driveway. So these sorts of things here, and then when it does detect the face, it streams video to uh, the server that I've set up. So this would be a typical uh, edge deployment of a device, and these devices cover a myriad of objects that are network connected. Once you get past the gateway, you're going more into the industrial and commercial realms of cloud management. And so you need to come up with a cloud infrastructure, and these infrastructures, of course, are provided by many different companies. There's Amazon, there's Microsoft, IBM, uh, China Mobile, Huawei, they all have their own clouds that you can deploy to. Intel has a cloud as well that you can deploy to. Um, so I'm not going to speak as much to this portion of it here during this particular demo. I'm going to focus in on the edge device sensors, the gateway, and the, how do you take a sensor and network it, how do you deal with the security of that, and how do you deal with the manageability of it. So the first thing that I was going to say is that the core of the gateway is, well, the operating system on the Intel IoT gateway is running on WindRiver Linux. WindRiver Linux is a hardened version of Linux that provides a number of very nice features, including whitelisting of processes that are able to run. So, for instance, when I was deploying this, the first thing I did was I started a database. And the first thing the operating system told me was, your database has not been given permission to allocate memory crash. So it, it told, came right out and gave me a security permission and uh, terminated the database. So I went and whitelisted it and then it worked fine. Uh, it also has a, a number of kernel hardening patches as well as firewall and other inbuilt security features that you can use. Part of the core of what I want to communicate here too is that while we were given the assignment of building a product um, or building a demo, uh, Components such as the firewall, the security, uh, the edge management, and the cloud management uh, can be upscaled. Wind River, for instance, provides their Helix Cloud, which will manage devices across an enterprise level network. Uh, they also have an edge management system that will allow you to manage sensors on a particular network. So while we're showing people how to use the, uh, the, the developer kit in order to create their own services and to integrate with the the uh, business processes that they have established already, you can always go from that sort of medium style enterprise deployment to a larger style enterprise deployment. So how do you break these things apart? Uh, also Intel System Studio here was used to analyze uh, various components of the C libraries that we use. Be aware that this is a great tool for doing those sorts of low level and in-depth uh, profile analysis. Okay, description of the actual thing we built. It's humongous here. So if you go to the end of the hallway and turn left, we are on the left side of the booth that says end-to-end -end solutions over here, commercial IoT. And this is the device that we built. We have a steel frame here that they, uh, was welded together for us. We have an Intel IoT gateway right here. This particular gateway is a, a Dell Marble Arch. It's got a uh, 1.5 gigahertz dual core Celeron processor in it. And over here we have three sensors. And these could be any sensors. They don't necessarily have to be Edison's. They could be Raspberry Pi's. They could be your company's proprietary uh, mesh radio network. It could be anything that's network connected. 
Uh, the, the goal of this is actually to emulate an environment in which we have a temperature controlled uh, room. So right here we have a temperature sensor, and above it we have a heating lamp. Uh, and of course overall here we have a mini fridge, which we've replaced the, the front to. And then we have some controls built in as well. This is a light sensor over here that will tell us when the light is on. And on the very back, we have a sound sensor that will tell us when the fridge is on. So these are all here with the goal of keeping this temperature right here at a relatively constant temperature. Uh, the temperature reading will come out right here. And the, so the, the demo itself is not the end means, it's the software that's behind it. But does anybody have any questions about what we're trying to do here? Is it because, because I kind of feel like I may have to refer back to the slide just for visualization at later times. Okay. Okay. So as I said, there are three Edison compute modules. One controls the temperature, the other one controls the light, and the, other, and the third one controls the refrigerator and, and uh, a lot of the sensor for the refrigerator. Um, these relays are, are actually <laughs> controlled solely from the gateway as well as the sensors. So the sensor modules, <coughs> sorry, here. Oh, sorry. One thing that I didn't uh, neglect to say also is that with this particular uh, demo, we have all the data going up to your choice of clouds. We currently enabled Amazon's uh, Kinesis, uh, Microsoft Azure, IBM Bluemix, and Google Data Store. But the demo itself has a pluggable architecture, so you can write your own module to put it up to whatever cloud you want. Um, this software is going to be released on GitHub under an MIT license. We're going to be using it for several of our upcoming commercial IoT workshops. So if you want to go through there and see how we took a prototype and added network connectivity to it or wrote an event management system, it'll be up there and available. And we hope you download it and you know, send your comments and show us how you've deployed it. But it, it is supposed to be a starter template, not a fixed project. It's something to show you how one might go about creating an infrastructure. Okay, so rather than the large uh, network architecture that we showed you at the beginning, we're going for more of a medium-sized network architecture. Here we have the various sensors that used to be on the prototype. They're now taken off the prototype and put onto a network. Uh, the user interfaces could be tablets, smartwatches, those are also network connected devices. Over here we have, well, these are other sensors that you could have here, the gateway and the cloud. So this is the architecture that we're looking at right here. One thing that can be said about the gateway, a couple of things, <coughs> actually, let's start with here. Uh, Real-time control. So real-time control refers to the fact that the gateway is able to monitor all the sensors on the network, they know exactly what the temperature is, knows exactly what the light, ambient light is, and it can react to the, tr the conditions of the sensors in order to trigger network events. So the gateway will monitor, in, in the particular case of this demo, if the temperature is over 27 degrees centigrade, uh, it will fire off a too hot condition and the, the refrigerator will turn on. If it's below 20, it will fire off the heating lamp, it will tell the two heating lamp to turn off. So this is, this is what's referred to as real-time closed control, loop, closed loop control. And that means that you don't need to actually have the event go out of your network <clears throat> unless you want it to. You can report it to the cloud, but the management of the system is all contained on the edge. The, uh, the gateway then provides an abstraction layer. First of all, it's a firewall. It uh, does not allow sensors to talk to the internet, and it does not allow anything on the internet to talk to your sensors. So this is done you know, particularly to make sure that your sensors are secure. And it's, it's a hard firewall. <coughs> anything that's on the internal network has to talk to the gateway, and then from the gateway to the cloud. Uh, the gateway here might have multiple radios attached to it. So you might have a Wi-Fi radio, you might have a Bluetooth radio, you might have a Zigbee radio, or a six low pan radio, or um, you know, any radio that a particular OEM decides to provide. And why this is nice is because the variety of objects that can be managed can be managed over different protocols simultaneously 
And then you get a protocol abstraction layer here between the gateway and the cloud. So the gateway and the cloud can talk um, you know, over one protocol while the modules on the local net talk on another. Um, we have uh, a secure boot, so the Intel IoT gateway supports the TPM module, the trusted platform module. What this means is that from the firmware level up, when the firmware is loaded, it has a cryptographic signature which is verified. If it is not verified, it doesn't load. So we'll start at the hardware level and verify each level of software, starting with the firmware, the operating system, the various modules on top of the operating system. And then finally, the operating system allows you to whitelist the processes that are run. So you can harden this, harden this uh, for deployment out in the field very easily. Uh, I've mentioned whitelisting before. Edge management, the IoT gateway. You can write your own management servers or you can buy from a third party <coughs> such as uh, Intel or Wind River that provides Helix Cloud. And you can also configure your own system for over-the-air updates. The gateway itself uses RPMs and has a secure RPM repository that you can manage so if your company has a particular set of software, you can have a secured repository to install from. So if you picture a hundred of these gateways out there deployed, you can issue commands that will upgrade these over the air. And then this is more uh, custom based on what you decide to do with the dev kit, but we, we enabled the four clouds that I mentioned earlier. So you can integrate those solutions here. This is the GitHub files for the project that we put together. We've just labeled it industrial demo. Right now it's a private GitHub repository, but very soon, as, as soon as uh, we crawl all, cross all our legal T's and dot all our legal I's, it'll be released under the MIT license. And we simply focus on making this as modular as possible. We have a database layer, a device abstraction layer, a gateway backend, which runs services such as event management and sensor management, and then a gateway front end, which gives us an administrative interface. All right. So one of the issues that we run into when we're talking to enterprises is that oftentimes their sensors will contain proprietary technology. Uh, right now in Oregon, if you're aware of this, a lot of the burglar alarm and fire alarm systems that are being deployed are being deployed on proprietary mesh radio networks. <laughs> and so there is an arms race going on in those areas where each company is trying to you know, install the most number of burglar alarms they can because when they have new installations, they have new points on their mesh radio network. Uh, so all of this is to say that from Intel's perspective, when we're coming to a customer, we don't necessarily know what their sensor is going to be. Um, even though Ajay spoke about all these sensors we've enabled, these sensors are you know, publicly available, but for ones that are private, we need to come up with a way of easily creating APIs or allowing these companies to create APIs for their own internal infrastructure and so they can integrate it into their own, their own processes. So what we did here is we First of all, made it easy for the sensor to be discovered on the network. So the sensor system that we came up with uh, deploys just a simple gateway discovery script. We're using Bonjour, for those of you who are familiar with the Apple terminology, uh, Avahi, for those of you who like Linux te uh, terminology, but it's basically an MDNS system that, that does uh, discovery of the gateway. And another thing to notice here is actually you can't notice it here. Let's see. So here's the gateway search. When the sensor comes up, it's going to announce to the network. First of all, you have to deploy a client side certificate for the sensor. The sensor is going to come up, it's going to announce its presence, and the gateway is going to ask it for its certificate. Uh, once the authentication handshake <coughs> is done, and actually in the future, if I had more time, I'd probably implement an OAuth system here. But once that authentication is done, the, the uh, sensor will actually announce its presence and it will send over a configuration file that has a description of its API. Uh, oops, I'm going backwards. The announcement is actually done in a protocol agnostic way. We implemented a 
uh, a transport manager. And the transport manager has a number of plugins underneath it. In the particular case of this demo, we implemented MQTT, <coughs> secure MQTT, uh, HTTP, secure H uh, TLS, HTTPS, and the sensors are all using MQTT because it's a streaming protocol. It's a protocol that happens about once a second, and uh, sensor updates can be queued and streamed in a real-time fashion. The lamp and the refrigerator are all configured over HTTPS. Um, so those are REST APIs that are called in order to actuate, uh, uh, in order to control events on your network. All right, these are the three um, events that we that we uh, made the transport manager uh, um, aware of. These events can be published over, like I said, MQTT, HTTP, and we're also working on a Bluetooth module, and we welcome other people to submit their own transport protocol modules. So in other words, the sensor might be working off a networked API, or it might be working off Bluetooth, or it might be working off some other, and we want to provide a protocol agnostic way of deploying them. Okay, so I've already mentioned this before. We use MQ, uh, secure MQTS, MQTTS, which is MQT over TLS. Once the sensor actually connects to the gateway, it sends over its configuration information. For instance, uh, the type of data that it's providing. Is it digital or analog? And the frequency, the maximum frequency at which this can be requested. So the sensor will provide that. And then, Once that announcement is made, the gateway is actually going to auto-generate a REST server that's deployed onto the sensor and a REST client that's deployed onto the gateway. Now suddenly your network can be, your gateway can be used to make HTTP calls to your sensor or to your actuator and all the management of that sensor actuator is on the gateway and not on the sensors. So the, the gateway is actually firewalling the sensors, the public internet can't connect to it, but all the management can be done on the gateway. And this is what the configuration file looks like. It's kind of hard to see. Here. But you just declare a sensor. These are all in JSON files, for our example. You declare a name, for, for example, temperature. You give it a description. You give it a maximum frequency at which it, be, it can be queried, in this case, once a second. Uh, you tell it which pin it's on and the type of transport mechanism that you want to use in order to communicate with it. In addition to this, the API file will be sent over as well. And that's Swagger. So this is a popular open source framework that allows you to describe APIs in either JSON or YAML. It's very uh, in agnostic as to the technology that's using it. And we can use this in order to generate the client side, the server side, and an HTML5 administrative interface. So when a sensor is connected in, there's an automatic discovery that happens. And on the gateway, suddenly a console will appear in your web application that allows you to directly talk to your lamp or your refrigerator. Are there any questions? I know I'm throwing a lot out there, and I don't have the demo directly in front of me. Okay. For our data, we, we created a, these are MQTT topics. So for every sensor that's on the network, the sensors are organized into a hierarchy under the sensors, and then each sensor has a unique ID, and then each sensor has data that's associated with it. We also created an error channel, and an actuator ID status channel, and an actuator ID trigger channel. Um, this trigger channel has actually been obsoleted uh, as of last week, so that's a little bit old. We're using HTTP uh, and REST calls for that. Okay, and then we went ahead and implemented an edge device management system. So this is a daemon, it's written in Node.js, it runs on the gateway, and it simply listens to the MQTT traffic that's happening on the local network. Whenever it finds a temperature, and it, it takes this temperature data and stores it into a database on the gateway. Um, that's its only purpose, it's fairly simple. It listens to announcements and data. And this is what our administrative console looks like. 
So you can see that uh, we have five sensors on the network at this particular time. We have one actuator. Triggers are what we call our network management events. So for instance, I can set up a trigger that says if the temperature is greater than 27, turn on the, 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 the air conditioning, the fridge. Or if it's less than 20, turn on the heat. In our system, when the temperature is over 27 and the light is, uh, and the refrigerator is not on, or the light is on, and then the same thing, if the temperature is too cold, the light should be on, the refrigerator should be off. So we can track these various events, and this is a quick administration console that we put together in Angular and uh, Bootstrap. We can also list all the temperature sensors and configure which cloud their data goes to on a per sensor basis. So if you want your data to go to Kinesis or to Azure or IBM Bluemix, it's as simple as writing a module for those things, installing your credentials in a JSON file, and then the administrative interface will pick it up. This is our Relay API. So the Relay API is responsible for turning the lamp on and off and the refrigerator on and off. Uh, the top one is the, the original refrigerator was the fan, and here's the lamp. These are auto-generated, like I said, by Swagger. So once the sensor announces itself to the network, the gateway can then communicate with it over HTTP automatically. Yes. And this is what the auto-generated form for controlling the actuators looks like. So what you do is you'd enter in light and then on right here and your light will come on. Of course, once you have this manual page here, you want to set up network events, like I said earlier, that will trigger based on your sensor data's conditions. Okay. So the security features of the gateway, I already mentioned that it has a secure group. It also has secure, uh, kernel security profiles. It uses a kernel repository providing additional patches and configuration defaults. This is from Wind River Linux, so you can get patches from them. It also has a package management system. I've mentioned that also, Secure RPM. And GR Security is the process whitelisting mechanism that's available. Uh, it will let you assign on a per-process basis whether a process can allocate memory, whether it can execute in certain environments. There are a lot of different options you can use here in order to specify exactly what wrongs are on your deployment gateway. Here are the four daemons that we built. I, I've already talked about the edge device daemon and the trigger daemon that monitors the uh, network and triggers events. The cloud daemon was written so that any information that's in the database on the gateway can be relayed up to the cloud. So it will simply take the temperature data and send it to Microsoft Azure or to IBM Bluemix. And then we have a data recall service here because our uh, administrative interface actually provides real-time graphs of the data that's going across. And it will provide historical data as well. So this particular service will talk to all those gateways and bring the information down and see what happens. Okay, and I just mentioned what these were. These are the daemons. Error conditions. So an error condition can be reported up to the cloud. Um, usually you want to keep all the event management inside the local edge network, but if there are important things such as a fan failure, if you need to change the light bulb on the left, those sorts of things can be triggered and sent to the cloud. Okay, so uh, the trigger daemon I've already mentioned that the triggers that you provide are written in JavaScript or some other programming language. They're stored in the database. They have access to all the sensor data that is available on your IoT gateway and also all the actuator information that's available there. And once a sensor is deployed, you can trigger them solely from the gateway. So from an administrative perspective, you've concentrated all the administration of your sensor network on the game. This is just a picture of the uh, software we're using to start all the daemons. We're using a package called PM2. 
PM2 will launch all your daemons and we'll monitor them. It will set up log files and other sorts of nice administrative things. Are there any questions? There must be questions. Uh, so my background is from smart buildings. Okay. And all engineers choose their own taxonomy for all kinds of sensors. Absolutely. So project Haystack, is there something equivalent that you've got here? Is there a microphone? You know, actually, could you stand up with the microphone? Oh, there's a microphone. And all engineers choose their own taxonomy, no one building is the same to the next, and sure. it's great complexity portfolios. But they've got a project Haystack, which is kind of XML for all kinds of components in the built environment. Is there something similar for sensors that you use? Or <coughs> So you're, you're building an XML-based taxonomy of the sensors? Well, there is a, there is a, a community project for that type of environment. And I was just okay. wondering if something similar is for sensors in IoT that, that you guys are, are subscribing to or developing. So really, uh, I know I spent a lot of time on a specific example, but what I'm trying to communicate is that the examples can be very flexible. You know, we provide programming languages and libraries to talk to sensors and then you can roll your own types of services. So if you have an XML-based uh, taxonomy, we support, in terms of languages, we support C, C++, JavaScript, Python, and Java. And so um, if you've written in any of those, it's really easy to use that in combination with sensors. That the other thing is you're, you're absolutely right, right? The protocols are the biggest challenge. And they're, the, they're the reason why IoT adoption is also very complex. Every industry has different set of protocols, different standards. Uh, in fact, uh, when we did like the production manufacturing segment analysis, we found that there was like 127 different protocols that we were using, right? um, and every one of them is proprietary, and like all of the companies want their solution to be end to end. And, right? The standards are many in each of those verticals. Um, what we understand the challenge, and that's why, right? We're, providing a set of translation layers on top of the gateway like that allows you to take some of those protocols and translate it to an array in which you can take and use MQTT and other standard ones to push it to the cloud so you can push the processing of what you can do with all of these various sensors that's talking in different languages, bring it to the edge, do some analytics, or throw it to the cloud and do some analytics and trigger an actuator back. So that level of translation and support is what the gateway offers, and that is why uh, many people like the gateways to be a lot more powerful, so they're able to do that level of translation on the edge, as opposed to doing everything, throwing all of your data to the cloud, and then doing the processing there, right? And that is why the edge analytics, edge processing, protocol translations, all of that is becoming important, and we are providing the software layers that enables you to do that. Um, I don't know if we answered your question or not, but I'm just saying that it is, um, we understand the problem, let me put it this way. And uh, we, are, we are working on specific use cases and examples that, that shows how uh, we can solve that. Uh, love to, like, you know, maybe take more information and, and see how we can support some of the things that you're talking about. So th this demo was specifically focused on one particular use case and how do you build the, the manufacturer for that particular use case. Uh, and keeping the overall dev kit flexible is, is really the goal here, so it can address a lot of use cases. Yep. concerning the dashboard. The first one is uh, about the errors, the errors part. <coughs> so I would like to know if the dashboard has the ability to present us the errors and then to give us a diagnostic and the related solutions to fix it. Yes. So the, the, the event management system is very generic. Uh, all you need to do in order to set up an event is you need to have a predicate function, something that returns true or false. So it might be, is the temperature over 27 and is the heating element still on? That, and if those conditions are true, you can write to your database, you can trigger an error, you can send your error to the cloud, 
Uh, you can do anything you could in a programming language. So they're, they're very flexible. Okay, thank you. And the second question is about the triggers. In, in addition to the triggers, can we have some KPIs to measure the performance of the sensors, for example, or the IoT gateways? And uh, as a service provider, can we define additional KPIs? I'm still not clear what you mean by KPI. Yes, in fact, um, as service providers, for example, we define some KPIs in order to measure the performance mm -hmm. to um, a gateway, for example. Okay. So um, it's very easy to us um, to consider these KPIs uh, during a troubleshooting, for example, to say that if the performance is good or not. If, if the KPIs are available on your edge network, so that yes. the, the triggers have access to any sensor data that's published over the internal ne edge network, and also to any actuators that are there. If those KPIs can be expressed over the network, then you certainly can do that. Yeah, you can, you can okay. have like some kind of business rules associated with KPIs, but, right? Right, th some th this rules is a, and policies. Yes, th exactly. this is a good example of, I would take a, so we, we had a very specific business case that we were, we were using and we wrote a server in order to meet the criteria for that. If you have a different criteria, you can certainly go through and modify it to your heart's content. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? If you want to see this demo, it's at the end, all the way at the commercial <coughs> IT booth. I guess we're going to let him go and then you. So uh, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned sensors and actuators and those things, and you touched on some of the security of those. What are yep. you seeing in the industry? How are most people securing these things? Because, you know, a sensor, a soil sensor off on a farm, yep. yeah, it's important, but not that important. But right. a temperature sensor in a nuclear power plant's a big deal. Right. So you, you talk about physical access to sensors. <coughs> and obviously, you know, that's... But I mean, how are you securing them when they're talking to the gateway, I guess, is really what I'm... How do I know that that's the sensor that was originally deployed and not, you know, not something else faking? Right, that right. Sensor? So it, one of the security maxims that's often talked about is don't reinvent the wheel. And so we like to use standard security me me mechanisms like TLS, you know, which you use for all your Amazon shopping, uh, OAuth, which is used for uh, authentication of devices to a complex network. Um, these sorts of things can be fairly easily implemented. So you're finding like certificates are installed. Right. Yeah, on install a certificate. Sensors and those kind of things. Yep. So yeah, that's one of the big things that uh, happens, right? When you are bringing up new sensor networks, and we have like a set of vendorware products, uh, including device management and things like that. If you can imagine that any of these sensors are <coughs> as devices, and uh, they are like whitelisted, and the communication mechanism is registered into your system. So we can ensure that, okay, that's the system that's talking to your gateway and that there's nobody else sending the information to a gateway and all that, right? You're kind of getting to what I'm, uh, getting to where I'm talking about here. Yeah, so right. now let's say I'm deploying 500 of these right. sensors, right? And if I'm doing certificates, how am I going to manage that? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, how am I going to manage that so that, that, you know, I don't spend all day? Exactly. Right. So, I mean, these here, this software was written by a five-person team. It's the integrate and roll your own method, but of course you can go to Wind River and these other enterprise And then there's solutions. a policy orchestrator tool that we have um, as well, right? Uh, with a security set of products. Like uh, we are very, very uh, focused uh, on, on making sure that uh, it's always like a what I should say is a win lose or a win win situation. Sometimes when you make the system so secure that developing anything on it becomes a nightmare. Right? Um, so that is why what we are doing is uh, we, we want to take some of the security features and let the developers not worry about that security aspects of it. So you can build like a prototype and capabilities and then we have a set of tools like a policy orchestrations and, and set of device management features and other functionality that we are adding. So that way the developer doesn't have to focus on it. It's like the operational people or the deployment people who can kind of set up what these devices are coming up, what it is really going in and things like that. And that's the real tools that Intel offers as a, as a company, right? We have like this McAfee set of products that, that enables you to do all of that, uh, those things. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I think I strongly encourage you to check it out because I think there is a whole team of folks whose life is penned around <laughs> security, right? Um, yeah, it's a critical question. We know the problem and we're working on solving it. Well, thank you and great job. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, there was a question here. Oh, my question is uh, how much is the hardware and the development kit cost is? Yeah, so the prototyping kit, right, um, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, I, I talk to developers uh, almost every day. And uh, we were talking to developers about, like, how do you really get started and do that, right? We are trying to keep the price below around $150. So that way you get a Galileo and you get like a set of sensors that you can start from a prototyping perspective. But when it comes to a real deployment, um, it depends on the gateway, it depends on your need, it depends on your use case, right? So there is gateways that range from the whole product and we work with a set of partners to enable those gateway solutions and, and software and hardware and everything else. We, we have priced uh, the, the initial cost or that's what we are trying to do uh, for you to get started. But once you evolve your solution, um, I mean, it's up to you, right? How complex your deployment can go. Uh, we have a range of products that support you through that journey.